<laughs> Hi, I'm Jenna Leighton. Um, thank you so much for letting us come today and give a presentation on our work at the Industrial Plan Superior. Um, let's see, a little background on me. I got my undergraduate degree in archaeology from Mercyhurst University out of Pennsylvania. Moved back here, got a job at ICF, which is a consulting firm doing environmental permitting, um, mostly, mostly National Environmental Policy Act, and I'm uh, the archaeologist and cultural resources specialist. Um, and went to the University of Denver for my master's degree. So that's me. Thank you. Um, I'm Laura Moran, and I um, did my undergraduate in Ohio at Oberlin, and then I moved out here um, to go to graduate school, also at the University of Denver, where we did our thesis um, at the same site. So we're giving this joint presentation on our site. Um, and I, while I was at University of Denver, I got very involved in ground penetrating radar. So now. I work for IDS Geo Radar, which is a company in Golden that manufactures GPR equipment. So I teach people how to use it and deal with um, all the problems when the equipment is not acting as a ship, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess we can just get started. Um, I think Jenna's going to take the first part and then we'll switch off. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Laura and my work at the Industrial Mine of Superior. Um, Laura and I performed fieldwork at the site in the summer of 2015 in pursuit of our master's degree for the University of Denver. Um, first, I'll go over um, the background and our research goals, and then we both will discuss the methods back and forth a bit. And then Laura's going to uh, go over the results of our analysis and research. And then if there's any questions at the end, we can do a Q&A. So this slide to orient us shows where Superior is in relation to Boulder. So up here is the southeast side of Boulder and Superior is down here, where that red circle is. And then this map is a little bit zoomed in that shows where the site is in relation to Superior. So you can see Highway 36 here, Coal Creek, and then the industrial mine and the mining camp was here. Um, here you can see a schematic of the mine and camp while it was in operation in the early 20th century. Um, you can see the mine features are here on the right, and this is where the camp was, where the people, the miners and their families lived and then some associated buildings. Um, and this image on the right is a modern aerial view of what the field basically now looks like today. So you can see a few extant remnants. This is the wash house. Here's the boarding house. And this is what we found was the supervisor's house. But of the dwellings you see here, there's nothing really remaining on the ground. It's mostly just scattered bricks. Um, you do see a little bit of a foundation here and this is what it looks like on the ground so um, it's mostly gone. <laughs> here on the left is a photo of what the mine looked like when it was in operation in the early 20th century. Um, again and then here's on the right is an image of what it looks like today. Um, as you can see, all of the buildings pretty much have been removed, and it's really just a flat field that now is used for livestock grazing at times. So let's go through some background. The mine was in operation from 1895 to 1945. It was originally owned by William Henry Hake until he sold the mine in 1900 to the Northern Coal and Coke Company, which was subsequently absorbed by the Rocky Mountain Fuel Company in 1911. The Rocky Mountain Fuel Company owned and operated the mine from 1911 until the closure of the mine in 1945, which um, by that time, nearly 4 million tons of coal were extracted from the mine. The industrial mine is part of the Northern Coal Field, along with many other mines in Northwestern Colorado, including the Columbine, Lafayette, and Louisville mines that stretch from Eastern Boulder County to Western Weld County. The Southern Colorado Coal Field, in contrast, is in the Southeast portion of the state, and includes Ludlow, Forbes, and Aguilar, among other mines. I'll talk more about Ludlow in a minute. 
Over the life of the mine, the camp of the industrial mine consisted of 21 houses, a boarding house, a wash house, a superintendent's house, and mine-related offices. The Denver and Interurban Railroad, which ran, which ran from Denver to Boulder, had a stop at Superior and was in operation from 1908 to 1926. Trains along the Union Pacific Railroad also would occasionally stop at Superior. The trains drastically decreased the time it would take to get to Boulder or Denver from Superior, um, providing a vast array of leisure, educational, and business opportunities for Superior residents and those at the industrial mine camp. It's fair to say that nearly all mines during this period have a long history of labor disputes, and the industrial mine and the other mines in the northern coal field are no exception. As scrip was increasingly used to pay miners in the 1890s and miners were expected to work longer hours, unionization became more appealing. The United Mine Workers of America had a presence in Colorado by 1891, and by the early 1900s, the majority of the northern coal, and northern coal field miners had a allied with this organization. Strikes began in earnest in the first decade of the 1900s, during which time many companies, including the Northern Coal and Coal Company, hired guards to keep the workers on company land. Wooden stockades, barbed wire fences, and armed guards near the tops of tipples and water tanks began to appear during the strikes. In 1910, the longest mining strike in Colorado history, dubbed the Long Strike, began on April 4th in the Northern Coal Field, and miners working on the industrial mine participated. Miners' demands included increased wages, payment in U.S. currency rather than company scrip, an eight-hour workday, safety improvements underground, a committee to hear grievances, protections of miners' rights to organize, and election by miners of Chuck Wayman at each mine, all of which the mine operators were not willing to provide. Skirmishes erupted, the most prominent of which was a shootout that occurred in November of 1911 between striking miners and scabs who I'm sure you know our workers brought in to replace the striking miners. One of the scout workers was killed in the shootout. The long strike continued for another three years. The breaking point arose after the massacre at Ludlow in the southern Colorado coal field on April 20th, 1914, which led to the deaths of an estimated 19 people, including two women and 11 children. The violence that occurred at Ludlow garnered national attention and the focus of the nation turned to the Colorado coal miners' strikes. More more violent outbreaks occurred in Northern Colorado coal fields after the Ludlow massacre, and by the end of November 1914, President Wilson finally called for federal mediation to end the long strike. The strike lasted for four years and eight months. Though periodic striking continued after the long strike, it was not until 1927 that another major strike broke out, this time at the Columbine mine, as the nation moved towards the financial crisis of the Great Depression. Much of what the miners had won during the long strike was lost. Most companies did, still did not compensate miners for dead work, which is any work necessary for the process of coal mining, but which did not actually produce coal, such as timbering coal rooms, clearing away rock piles, and laying railroad track. Violent outbursts occurred throughout 1927, and unionizing, unionizing underwent a resurgence. Miners throughout the northern coal field, as well as other groups, joined together to pick a strike and demand action. The strike finally broke when an independent committee was commissioned to investigate the matter in 1928. The committee found that the miners' claims of unfair practices and wages were justified. During this time, the leader of the Rocky Mountain Fuel Company was taken over by Josephine Roach. Roach was instrumental in changing the company's policies towards striking miners, as well as increasing wages and working conditions for the miners. This only occurred after many months of work struggling to gain control of the company's board, which she finally did in March of 1928 by purchasing the holdings of a Denver real estate investor. Under Roach's leadership, relations between the Rocky Mountain Fuel Company and the miners dramatically improved. So that's sort of a brief history of the mine and the goings on. Um, for us, over our overall research goal when we began investigating the site was to explore the material conditions of domestic spheres of the, spheres of the site archaeologically to reveal expressions of class identity of, minor, of miners and gender roles and expectations. So let's talk about some methods. Um, here I'm going to talk about some of the sources we went through to perform archival research on the mine. The Denver Public Library and the Boulder Library have collections of papers from the Northern, or sorry, of the Rocky Mountain uh, Fuel Company that contained information about the operations of the industrial mine, as well as schematics of the camp and historical photographs that we used extensively. 
The Superior Historical Commission has conducted a plethora of research about the camp and the camp houses that was immensely helpful in our research. They also have many historical photographs that they gave us access to, including these that I'm showing. And we were lucky enough that there are still people alive today who were children at the industrial mine camp while the mine was in operation. They provided first-hand accounts of life and relations at the mine, as well as, for example, here, names of families who lived in each house before the mine closed in 1945. And then Laura's gonna talk this a little, about this a little bit more on the next slide. Um, we also had access to plenty of oral history at this site, which is um, very exciting and not usually something that you have a lot of access to. Um, so the Marie Rogers Oral History Program, um, it's one of the largest collections of oral history in the nation, and they have, um, they went through and they collected uh, recordings of descendants and like former residents of the mine. Um, because most of the interviews were conducted in 2002, all of these people were children when they actually lived in the mine. Um, so it allowed us just to learn more about daily life the industrial mine. All the collaborators were children when it was operating. Um, which gives a unique perspective into especially the domestic sphere, which is where both of us were primarily interested. Uh, so some of the important takeaways that we learn from the different oral histories um, are things about how the friendships between children seem to be able to cross socioeconomic barriers um, with friendships between the minor's children and the superintendent's children. They talk one specific person details like going on a camping trip with the superintendent's family and their <laughs> children. But um, it does seem to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Because one of the other informants in this case um, was the son of the man who ran the company store. And even though he was a worker um, and not necessarily, you know, any didn't have a leadership position within the mining company itself, there were tensions between that family and the mining family. And they, they didn't bear, they didn't get along and they sort of viewed the the person who worked at the company store as not really on their side. Um, and then we also learned that families made changes to their homes. We're gonna play it with um, a, a, a former resident, Bob Morgan, and he talks about how in, in their particular house they had a garage, but not many other houses did. So this gives us some indication that even though all of the houses are identical, that people within their limited agency and like a pretty highly controlled environment, we're doing things to change um, their surroundings in whatever limited ways they could. Um, and then uh, they talk about, a lot of the children talk about home camping, uh, which was a, definitely a strategy to stretch income as a way that women were contributing to the economic um, situation in the households. And they, and it's, Specifically, one informant talks about how families make conscious consumption choices. So in the northern coal fields, uh, the industrial mine was actually pretty unique in that it had a company store. Most other mines in the northern coal fields did not. Um, but because of this, we have like an account from a woman who grew up in the mine, and she talks about how her dad would never make it at the company store. Um, and even though he had to go all the way to Boulder to not do that, that was something that he was willing to do because he didn't want the company to have control over that portion of his life. So we can see that families are, are definitely thinking these, their economic situation through and making the best choices that they can or what they think the best choices they can um, to improve their own agency. So we have a clip here and we can let Jeff live. I don't think we can play it from here. A small house, four rooms, had a kitchen, and uh, two bedrooms, room bedrooms, and then it had a living, a living room, basically, didn't have a dining room or a living room. One thing about the industrial mine camp was we had running water in it, not a bathroom, didn't have a bathroom, still had the outhouses. They did have a uh, a water system where you know the uh, the sink and the kitchen had running water. It didn't have the hot water. <laughs> oh, yeah. the, uh, the mine had a um, a uh, pump behind uh, 
spring, which was down below the camp. And they had a tank and they pumped the water up to the tank. They're the eating camp as well as the mine, because the mine had its had a bathhouse, of course, and boiler room to create steam and so forth for their voice. And uh, we had a, a little enclosed porch in the entrance to the kitchen. There was a an entrance to the west side of the house and on the east side of the house. And we all, uh, we had a garage on our house. We were asking why most of the other ones didn't. We did have a little garage on our uh, We had a, well, of course, the outhouses. We had, we had one of those. And uh, we had a chicken coop. And I remember the chicken coop because I had to clean the thing. And, the summer, one of my, uh, not my favorite job, <laughs> uh, my brother was born in, the, in our house uh, in 1938. So this is just an example to of like some of the things we can learn. We get a time stamp of, you know, a specific time that they were living in the house in 1938. At least we know that the family was established there. Uh, the other thing that he talks about a lot, which is, um, sort of a common theme that we see in a couple of the oral histories is he talks about how they have running water. Um, and that was kind of a point, it seems to have been a point of pride because um, you can, you get the sense that, that the Myers children felt that people in the town kind of would look down on them for not having a lot of money and things like that. But a lot of, a lot of the houses at this time period that were in the town did not have running water and the miners did so they kind of use that as like a point of pride to be like you know we might not have as much money as we would like our houses are running water um so we just learn a little bit too about some of the social dynamics that were at play all right so now we're going to go in back into some of the geophysical methods so we did two different geophysical surveys we started with magnetometry um these are both me <laughs> and you can see, so the fun thing about magnetometry is that you cannot wear any, have any metal on you at all while you're conducting surveys. So if you're lucky enough to get to conduct it in the snow, you have to find creative ways to keep warm while not wearing any metal. Um, and then typically what you do, you can see these ropes on the ground. Um, they're a meter apart and you just walk and you have to keep a specific pace. It keeps like every second and you just have to walk a consistent pace and it is measuring um, what you're doing is you're measuring how magnetic objects and features affect the Earth's magnetic field in localized areas. So um, this helps us in historic sites and anything can have like will show up. Um, and then we can kind of occasionally we can find foundations, things like that, because bricks are going to be fired at a certain point and that will reach um they they can acquire their remnant magnetization through like the firing of clays and bricks. Um, so <coughs> looking for a contrast between the difference in the magnetism of the natural environment and then features or objects um, that were either introduced or modified by humans. So this is the map we created. Um, ignore this part. That was a bunch of bushes and is what we call dummy data. It doesn't exist. Um, but a lot of this, like this information here, I'm pretty sure that this is related to the infrastructure of the mine. Like, these are not foundations in any way. These are just like very metallic features. They could be probably you know, related to you know the running water we've heard so much about. Um, so we're looking actually at like some of the smaller features. So we ended up digging over here, um, thinking that these sort of circular figures could potentially be burn areas. So potential um, hidden sites, things like that. Um, over here, this actually is a foundation. So that's where that cluster is coming from. Um, so we investigated over here and then over here in this cluster. But we basically went back over certain areas in here with ground penetrating radar. So we took a selection of the areas that we thought were interesting here, and then we did some more GPR surveys. So GPR is um, another remote sensing technique. Um, essentially, what you're doing when you're using your own penetrating radar is you are sending um, electromagnetic pulses into the ground, um, and then changes in ground composition um, 
it will cause some of the radar rays to be reflected back. Um, any kind of change, any difference in the material, the two adjacent materials will essentially cause um, a change in velocity, and that velocity change is what's going to cause some of that radar to be reflected back to the receiving antenna. The lead antenna has a transmitting antenna and a receiving antenna, so you record everything with that receiving antenna, and then we look at it on the meters. So, when you start out, you get an image like this, which, if you're not familiar with it, can start looking like static on a TV screen. But if you get good at it, you can start to see patterns and associate them to um, what might be happening in the ground. Um, essentially, you, it's somewhat similar, um, at least the put in acquisition to the magnetometry, because you're still going to be walking in transects. Um, in this case, this, I think, is um, a 900 megahertz antenna, so we were going every 25 centimeters is how frequently uh, we collected this data. So you can see, once you collect all of the data, you kind of, with the computer program, you can smush it all together, and you can slice it in this direction so that you get what we call slice mass, and that's going to be a more aerial view. So this is like a cross-section of the ground, and then this is like um, a plan view. So here, you can see, start seeing the foundations of the house. And that's what we're seeing here. And all of this over here, this is probably brick fall because in this area, there, that was where most of the brick was. So you can see the foundations, but then we have a brick scatter over here. Um, and then this is like a very high, what we would call very high amplitude reflection. That is right about in this corner. And from what we can tell, when we excavated it, it could be excavated in this area. There was a what looked like you know slate things like that because it was on the corner of the house. Um, my interpretation is is that not necessarily because the first we're like maybe it's a garden feature, maybe it's a pathway, things like that. I actually think that it may have been um, something laid down that could have helped with drainage, something like that, like a, a quick fix. It doesn't seem to necessarily be related to, to gardening or making paths, things like that. But we did. This is from the same survey on either side. So this comes from a book that the Superior Historical Commission um, published, and it was drawn by one of the former residents of the mine. So this gives us a little bit of an insight into what the rooms would have looked like and, and how they would have been laid out. So just a four-room house. Um, and we hear that there are cellars. And in, the, in one account, we hear that there are right off of this door off the kitchen, which makes sense. Um, it would make sense to put the cellar kind of as close to the kitchen as you could. Um, and we see these reflections here and here could be cellar walls where, where it was dug out. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to bet that that is, that is what it, that is. However, we also see very compelling evidence over here of the same kind of signatures. And to me, these actually are better signatures of a wall and you can kind of see over here kind of some fill but that would be on the opposite side of the house and not where our oral history says so this could be a couple of things one these are children who are remembering things many many years later so maybe they got the location of the cellar wrong the other thing could be that people are adding on cellars to their houses to increase the amount of food they can store so they can stress during them um that is my preferred theory <laughs> Um, oh, oh no. And this is just an overview that shows um, where we did the magnetometry survey. And then all, all of these are the different GPR surveys that we did. And these are very hard to see, but there's tiny little uh, red lines. We were very limited in what we could excavate, so we tried to cut across features with, um, with basically long speed trenches. So those are our actual excavation trenches. Um, so just to get an overview of where that went. Short takeover. <laughs> For a long time. Um, so we also performed your standard surface pedestrian survey over the entirety of the site, including the um, mine, where the mine was, and the camp portions. Um, we relied heavily on volunteers to help us perform this portion of the investigation, investigation, many of which came from this chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society. So thank you all very, very much for promoting and coming out. 
Um, and then for this survey, we had volunteers work in three to five meter or basically you know, fingertip to fingertip transects, putting pin flags next to all service artifacts. And then Laura and I followed behind um, using a Trimble Geo Explorer to collect GPS point locations of all service artifacts that contain diagnostic features. Um, and then we actually collected all of these diagnostic artifacts. So that would include, you know, your decorated ceramics, bottles or ceramics with maker's marks, artifacts with dateable manufacturing marks, really anything that could give us a clue to when the artifact was made or by whom. Um, because we had the, um, the triple uh, GPS equipment, we were then able to just like, this, this is a super great analytical tool, but it gives you an idea of where we can see some artifact distribution. So we basically just map the distribution of artifacts over the site. Um, and it also just gives you an idea of like the extent of our service survey. Um, the other one is um, that magnetic anomalies versus artifacts. Um, it didn't, was not very statistically interesting, but you can see it there. <laughs> um, Okay, so then after analyzing and comparing the results of our GPR magnetometry and uh, pedestrian <coughs> surveys, we selected four areas to uh, excavate. We dropped in four seven by half meter grids. We chose this sort of like unusual skinny long shape to one, try to hit as many concentrations of features that we could see in our various surveys, as Laura said, and two, um, to not exceed the maximum service disturbance limitations on our permit. Um, we dug in 10 centimeter arbitrary levels within a natural strata. Um, we, each trench was excavated using a combination of trowel and shovel techniques, and we screened all dirt removed through a half inch screen and photographed each level. Um, all subsurface artifacts exposed through excavation were collected. And here is some of the stuff that we found. Um, lots of glass and ceramic, as you can see, some butchered bone and um, some household goods. So now, now um, Laura's going to take it over to talk about uh, analysis results. All right. So um, I kind of broke this down by ceramic um, analysis and then glass analysis. So um, this is compare like this is a comparative analysis between Berwyn, which is um, the the mine where the level triggers were working. So um, there's a lot of comparative data to work with with this mine, and it's interesting to look at the southern coal fields versus the northern coal fields, um, especially since a lot about the way that the camps were were a bit different. So like, for example, in Berwyn, when they like before the strike, a lot of the housing was actually built by miners themselves, um, and they were larger houses. And because of that, women were able to take in borders because they had the space to do that. Um, and then in Superior, the houses were all built by the company and are very small houses, they're like 672 square feet. And so they basically like, just did not have space to take in borders, so it limited like their economic options. Um, and we can see some of this play out a little bit in the artifacts um, in interesting ways. So, um, and and both of these mines were sort of, were um, started during the American Victorian period. And so during this time, we see a lot of um, emphasis in like the dominant culture on um, like fine de decorated ceramics, um, you know, tea rituals are, are a big thing, things like that. And that's gonna be in like your upper middle class and middle class. Um, atmospheres, but there were a lot of sort of movements at this time where uh, middle class reformers were trying to impose these values on working class people. So we can kind of see through ceramics whether or not um, these populations are trying to emulate these middle class values or whether or not they don't really care. Um, um, so here in Berwyn, you can see um, some of the differences. The big difference is, is that in Berlin, there's like almost no finely decorated ceramics. They don't really care about it. Whereas in Superior, they actually have quite a bit. Um, and so some of this is gonna be, is, is related to decision making. So in Berlin, before the strike, they were, they had 
they had the opportunity to earn wages like through boarding. And because of that, you have a lot of undecorated, you have a lot of undecorated on the boat. That makes sense. It's going to be the cheapest, the easiest to replace. And most of the time, it's going to be the sturdiest, too. Um, but they wouldn't have spent a lot of money on buying decorated ceramics if they're taking orders and like on a consistent basis who may break things all the time, who are not necessarily part of the family dynamic, things like that. Whereas in Superior, they seem to be a little bit more um, willing to participate in the more dominant um, cultural ideas about you know decorating and and ceramic use. So they seem to be sort of kind of trying to emulate those values a little bit more. Um, in terms of glass, we see a couple other things. Um, so. <coughs> We broke this down into like medicinal alcohol, food prep, hygiene, food storage, and just some soda bottles. So some interesting things are um, this food storage. So in Berlin, you see a lot less food storage than you see in the industrial line. Um, and so that's essentially coming down to home canning. So in Berlin, because they were they had the income from boarding and also the sort of time costing of boarding, they weren't doing a lot of home canning, they were spending money to like buy canned goods because they had the income from boarding and also they just didn't have the time to do it because they were taking care of the boarders that were, that were essentially living, living with them. Um, in the industrial line, they didn't have that income so they had to stretch their wages in other ways um, and they would have had more time to commit to the home canning because they weren't having to think about taking care of their workers all the time. Um, the, and then this is just back to the other interesting um, area is alcohol. There are a lot more alcohol related uh, art glass artifacts in Berlin than in the industrial mine. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat. This is before the long strike, um, so this would have predated prohibition. Whereas most of our artifacts could potentially come from the Prohibition era. So that's a pretty big caveat. But we also do have um, oral history of a child who says that, like, her, my parents never drank, and nobody really drank um, at the mine, and things like that. And that could just be like a child not necessarily knowing um, the dream habits of adults. But it seems that there is some evidence that there wasn't a lot of alcohol consumption, and alcohol consumption tends to be very associated with um, with, uh, with with like male bonding and um, camaraderie and things like that, which can play into uh, labor disputes and, and forming solidarity. So that's an interesting point. So some basic conclusions is. We really relied on our archival research. We really relied on our stakeholders, like the Superior Historical Commission, um, and our descendants. We got to talk to Bob Morgan in person, and not just through oral histories. Um, and we relied a lot on our non-invasive remote, remote sensing techniques. So here are some four big conclusions, and then each slide will kind of detail more of them. So we've got more highly decorated ceramics um, in Superior than Berlin. We have more canning-related artifacts, fewer alcohol-related artifacts, and then we do see changing of the built environment. So this can indicate a willingness to participate in like, the dominant middle-class Victorian culture in a way that we don't really see in Berlin. Um, and it can also indicate like it could potentially be striving to, to become part of the middle class. It could also be positioning themselves better in terms of in terms of bargaining power. So if you align yourself with the people that you're bargaining with, they might be a little bit more sympathetic to you. Um, more canyon related artifacts. So again, houses were just too small to support taking in borders. So you can stress the income. Um, it could also have been during this time a way to kind of position mining families as patriotic Americans. Most of the mining, like the majority of miners were immigrants or at least from immigrant families. Um, and during this time, like pre and post World War One, there was a lot of um, anti-immigrant sentiment. 
And as part of the World War One war effort, there were a lot of um, pushes for like home gaming classes and things like that to sort of support the war. And it was a way for families to sit to like sort of position themselves as participating and supporting the war effort. And it was very important to be seen as patriotic Americans, especially during the time of labor disputes, because that would be a way for companies to sort of push back against any kind of demands for um, for better wages, better conditions, and to get the sympathy of their neighbors. So again, prohibition could have played a role in this, but um, the lack of these artifacts could potentially indicate that women's social networks, more than men's, could have formed a solidarity needed in labor struggles. Um, and if we go back to that home canning, home canning can be a very cooperative activity, um, especially if you're canning things like um, meats and things like that, and you typically need a pressure cooker. Um, and in Berwyn, at least there's some evidence that there would have been um, households would have gone in on an item like that together because it was a very high cost item. So you could see um, like social relationships forming over home canning. Um, we also do, even though we have a lot of highly decorated surroundings, we don't see a lot of like surroundings that are related to tea consumption. We see them mostly related to coffee consumption. Coffee tends to be associated much more with like with genuine friendship and and going out like sharing a cup of coffee with your friend. Whereas tea related artifacts tend to be like more highly ritualized and kind of about showing off. Um, so we see a lot of uh, in the ceramic uh, artifacts that this would have been potentially a very cooperative environment. Um, so, and then changing the built environment. So, in a company town, and especially in a camp housing situation, um, the mine families would have had very little control over a lot of their environment. Um, but they do appear to have made changes where they could. So, um, these changes could have seemed small, like we know some people added closets to their homes. Um, but that would have allowed them to participate more fully. Like at this time, we're seeing in the actual other middle class houses, like parlors and, and designated private spaces are becoming more and more popular. So people are trying to add on those little spaces where they can. And they also were potentially adding on sellers, which would have allowed them more financial freedom. And so we're just kind of seeing these little glimpses of agency where people are taking agency in a, like, a highly restricted environment. Um, and yeah, that's, that is the, most of our conclusions, anyway, <laughs> that is our field dog, aka my dog. What's his name? Astro. <laughs> Best question of the night. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, metal detectors, and so I was curious if you had considered using metal detectors because obviously, well, that would have been a prime place. Yeah, so do you want me? I should be looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, please. Okay. Um, the question was, did we consider using um, metal, like a metal detector as opposed to a magnetometer? Um, I don't know, some of this was down to what we had access to in terms of equipment. Um, so as far as I know, we didn't have access to a metal detector. I also don't have experience in metal detecting. So I, I didn't consider it for this site, um, mostly because they, it, it, at this point in time, and at that point in time, didn't necessarily fall within my skill set. Um, but it, it definitely could have been a useful tool. There were a, a lot of metal artifacts. Um, and you can, you can even see that from my geometry. Like some, you can argue that that map is, is could have been very there's so much metal in the ground that is seems to be related to the actual to the operation of the mine that it could be the steering like actual artifacts that we're interested in so there could have been other methods that would have been better just one follow-up the class that was mentioned earlier that i guess simon's going to have it covers all this stuff i actually took that for angle it's pretty cool to walk around you're one device to me is like a really big metal detector. They are so they are so <laughs> gotcha. Did you get any information about the garden? If they were doing all this canning, is there one big group garden or do they have little yards 
So how did they find okay. me? The questions are about gardens and whether or not uh, we got information about that. We didn't get information from excavation about gardens, no. um, but there is um, there is a lot of we know that they were gardening. There was the Superior Historical Commission says that, and I think they get this from their from the former residents that there were garden competitions. Um, garden competitions were actually like for like the best garden. They were not that uncommon for um, mining sites and like company towns, because especially in this time of like leading up to and during World War One, because um, you had a whole victory garden sort of uh, craze going on, but also it would have won um, kind of fostered like competition and individual like individualism among um, among the miners, which. The companies actually liked to foster that more than potentially like solidarity. They like they, they wanted the workers to think of themselves as individuals and not necessarily as a group. Um, and then also it would have if people are growing gardens, um, it's it's kind of complicated because in one sense you have the company like um, encouraging this, but it also would have been a way for for um, individual families to potentially like resist the money a little bit because they can it can stress their income through their gardening ability. So. Mm -hmm. um, what nationality were the immigrants? I'm thinking, I've heard there were a lot of Italians, is that right? Um, yeah, so it varies. Uh, the, the question was about the nationality of the immigrants. Um, we definitely see Italian families, um, a lot of um, like, Irish, English, Welsh in the beginning, and then like over time, it tends to switch more to Eastern European immigrants. Um, that seems to be the trend. Um, you might be able to speak to this more. Yeah, no, basically that would seem um, the Eastern immigrant uh, miners. So at the beginning when the mine was first established, most of the um, miners, like Laura was saying, was from sort of like Western European countries. Um, and they were highly skilled and knew what they were doing, how to mine and everything. And then once sort of they were disputes picked up um, and they were protesting, um, companies would hire scabs from the Eastern European countries that um, in that time were not necessarily as skilled in that particular form of mining. So uh, they were more like the, the less expensive workers that companies would hire to bring in a labor force. And I, you mentioned you thought coffee was more social than tea. I think from the English background, tea was the thing and they didn't drink coffee. So that would be the social stuff. There's a really good article um, that's, that's it's pretty old at this point, but it's, uh, it's Diana de Zergawal, Um And she talks a lot about like, the ritual of tea drinking. So um, yes, in a lot of like, I would, I would, Probably think that in working class families in, in England and the UK and things like that, that tea could be very much a like social and, and friendly interaction. But we see a lot that tea becomes very ritualized, where people have like they, they have tea parties and they invite people over and they have specific sets of ceramics that they they lay out. And it, it almost becomes competitive in a sense. Where Whereas we don't really see that sort of in terms of like just like the, the vessels themselves, um, that sort of competition with like coffee glasses, they can be a lot simpler. And, and so basically like the, the conclusions that she draws are that with the tea ceremony being like we get really fancy ceramics from that, but it's more a little bit about like showing off like look at these things I have as opposed to necessarily being like why don't you share this with me? But didn't the English and the Scottish drink tea at every meal and never coffee? They drink coffee. Well, but <laughs> my, my experience I mean, and my heritage, yeah, tea, 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 there's tea, definitely tea, like, tea, like a lot of a lot of tea drinking, but it it, tend, it tends to be at least in like mining in this, in these environments, probably coffee would have been a more common drink. Um, but I'm sure there was plenty of tea drinks as well. Um, and it's possible that they were drinking tea out of like coffee, glass. coffee glasses and just going against the, uh, the like more ritualistic aspects of like high tea afternoon tea that we all associate with English tea drinking rituals. I was thinking, what's available? What could you buy in the one mining town and what could you get in the other? In terms of coffee, tea, other foodstuffs or dishes, 
you know, what's available that they could get? Would yeah. that be different? It could be different, but we do have like the company stores, and especially time in times when they were paid in script, they would have mostly had only that available. But you know, most of I would say most of our artifacts are from about like the period of the twenties onward. And at that time, they were no longer at least here they were no longer being paid in script. Um, so they could have shopped around, and we. Took a look at um, you know some Sears catalogs, catalogs and some like Montgomery Ward catalogs. So they, they would have had the ability to buy kind of anything that they that they was available, like based on obviously their their income things like that. But for a choice, yeah. Is is there a demographic data for this period? Uh, number of children. There's census records over there. Yeah, so the question was about demographic data. So there are census records. Unfortunately, census records can be very tricky. So there's really only one good census for this. So like um, the census occurs obviously throughout the life of mine, but in only one of the sen the census the censuses um, in the 1920 census did they did the census taker actually delineate like this is the mine camp, and in all the other years. I cannot figure out what is the mine camp and what is not. <laughs> but so. yeah, but there is um, other data that other researchers have done for nearby camps in the northern coal field, which sort of which show these demographic and population trends. Which are what? Uh, well, like uh, Louisville and uh, Lafayette, but like sort of the researchers have written books about mining in the northern coal fields and. Are you, sorry, are you talking about them? In terms of, um, in terms of like heritage, or in terms of, uh, in terms of number of children per family, oh, you could get that from the census. I didn't necessarily. Yeah, I can't get them. At least I haven't found demographics on like time of death. Um, you could potentially try to glean that from census data in a sense if you can track a family through the years, but. Um, you can get like the the number of people within a household. Yeah, from a census you could because it, it goes household by household and it lists people like um, head of house and then like wife, child, and so if people are boarders and I, I have this in, in my thesis, I just didn't put it in this presentation, but like you can see what percent of households are taking boarders. So like I think in Berlin pre-strike it was something like sixty percent of Houses in here, it was only like eight percent. There were only like two, one or two houses out of the whole thing that had borders, and, and they're listed as a border in terms of census. Yeah. Show the map again that shows the family names. Oh, yeah. sure. Show me just kind of. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. The family names one is here. Just, but, oh, the name. Do you have a relative? No, I'm just wondering what that, this is. You could guess by the names. Yeah, and this is certainly from the later portions of the mine. This was actually put together by Bob Morgan and Denzel Acklin, and this is Denzel Acklin right here when he was a child. So what and this is his house. This will probably be in the late 30s, because um, we get that date of 1938 when Bob's brother was born. So. Probably mid to late 30s and then through potentially the end of the line, which was 1945. Yeah, a mix of names there. Yeah. Are there two families living in each house? Is that what? Um, I think what they're trying to show is uh, the, the families that they remember. So it could have been that during their childhood, one family lived there and then they moved out and the next family lived. There. I don't oh. think we see two families living in a household. Yeah, they're just yeah, a little small. <laughs> Can you show the one? Oh, oh, sure. Like this one or this one? There's like a bike trail right here, so you can bike right by it. <laughs> What? I, I don't see where it is on the map. Oh, oh. I mean, this this is just like the oh, okay, whole so site. 
So there's this cold creek ditch, and then this is really kind of hard to see from here, but this little area, this is like a bike path now. And so you can kind of walk right along it. And it used to be where the railroad was, so it's graded and everything. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So um, what did they do with their trash? Um, that's a good question. I could, we didn't, we didn't necessarily find it in, so that, that burn area, um, it, I think it, I think probably they could have put a lot of the trash just on the slide heap, um, which is where they just deposited, like, all of the refuse from the mine. So, that, that's my working theory. You didn't find a lot of them. Yeah, and so the, um, my, like, the, the houses were eventually, I, after the mine shut down in 1945, the houses were sold, um, so the company could, you know, get as much money from they could. They were the company's houses, and actually, there's still existing houses um, in Boulder. And the um, actual there's a mine or a museum um, right next to the site that is inside of an old house. So I think a lot of like clearing um, of the site happened. A lot of disturbance since then. Now that it's um, pasture and um, grazed on by cattle. So a lot of stuff is not there really anymore. Um, and actually when we did do the, like some sort of survey, a lot of the stuff was in where like the um, actual industrial part, a lot of like trash and stuff was in the industrial part of the, um, of the actual mine itself. Um, the deposition isn't super deep. So yeah, yeah. just the best can. <laughs> we probably- we The deepest we dug down was about 30, 40 centimeters. Yeah, the question was how deep were we able to go and with our limitations from various fronts, yeah. including timing and yeah. permits. Um, the deepest we probably went was like 35, 40 centimeters. <laughs> Pretty shallow. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the union that organized was the uh, United Mine Workers, UMW, um, but it wasn't the Western Federation of Miners? No, so um, in well, in the in the long strike, it was the United Mine Workers of America, and then in the 1927 strike, it was actually the Wobblies, um, because the, at that point, the IWW. So at that point, the um, the the United Mine Workers of America had basically like lost all of their their power, um, and so the more sort of like extreme group kind of was able to rise up and, and take over in terms of like being the union that was available. So was the WFM involved in the Southern uh, control field? Not that I know. I, it seems to be the United Mine Workers of America in in most of the at least Colorado related um, areas that I looked into. Yeah, so if you <clears throat> bring explain the difference between what you learned from magnetometry versus ground penetrating radar and how deep this is your Okay. Good question. So I am much more of a GPR expert than a mag expert, so I had more help in terms of the mag portion of this. So I'm not I'm not gonna be able to talk about this as in depth as I can talk about the GPR. Um so mag the magnetometry map you can you can do them much more quickly than you can do a GPR survey um, because you're not necessarily driving something over the ground. Your spacing can be a meter, um, and you just get to walk at like one standard pace. Um, so this, we did this first to as a way to be like, let's give ourselves an idea of where to start. So that's kind of how we used it, and then we used the information from here to place our GPR grids. So that's I didn't I didn't really make a lot of um, I would say, like, you use the magma for a lot of actual analysis. I kind of use it as a guide more. Whereas with GPR, and some of this is because I'm just more familiar with GPR than I am with mag, and some of it is because um, GPR can actually give us, um, in, my, in my opinion, a little bit more information than mag can. Because you asked about depth. I am not sure. Sure on, on the depth of mag and it, mag doesn't really give you depth. So that's the map that we have for, for the mag. We, I can't go in and say, hey, that's that's at this step, that's at this step, that like it, it's just measuring the red magnetism. Um, and then for the GPR, 
here, there is an actual depth scale. So this can give me a little bit more information because I can see in sort of X, Y, and Z. Um, and so for this, I can do a little bit more actual analysis. Um, so basically what, what you're seeing um, in the profile data is you're looking at, um, you know, this is the distance you travel and then you have your depth in the ground. And all of those reflections are your high amplitude reflections. Um, and then there are positive and negative reflections um, because if you think about the wave going down, here's like our midpoint and it's going to go down like that. And so some of that's going to be positive reflections, some of that's going to be negative reflections. So we color those in black and white. Um, and then we push all of those together and we slice them this way to produce those maps. Now those maps are a lot easier to understand in terms of just like looking at it visually, but these actually give us a lot more information in terms of being able to see individual reflections. So like, for instance, that reflection. There, that could be like any of these, but it's actually this one right here, and that's just because I was able to compare that. So what you want to do is basically you want to take the profile data and that plan view data and look them together, um, because sometimes you see better information on one than the other. So those are reflections of artifacts? They are reflections of anything that is potentially in the ground. So that's one of the dangers with GPR is that it, it doesn't just show you what you want to see, it shows you potentially everything. Now there are some times when GPR won't show you things because you're looking for differences. So if what you're looking for is um, is too similar to the surrounding matrix, then you may not see it. So an example that I give um, in like my day-to-day -day job, because most, most of the people I work that are actually using GPR for utility mapping. Um, in some areas of the country, there are still clay pipes, and sometimes clay pipes are inside clay soil. So you may not see that pipe because it is not different enough from its surrounding matrix to produce a reflection. So there are sometimes that you won't see what you're looking for. And then there's sometimes that interpretation will be really difficult. For example, like this area, pretty sure this is all just bricks that fell over or the name of the house. And because I can, because those bricks are there, I can't see anything else but the brick. So, you know, sometimes it gets obscured by things that you don't, you don't care about that much. And there's a clutter of rocks, right? Very good. Colorado soil, everything. Yeah, and Colorado soil is really quick. Like, you asked about all the rock. You did ask about depth. Um, the answer for GPR is it depends. Um, <laughs> So, like, how deep can you see? It depends on the soil that you're in. Um, so, in this area, we can have a lot of clay soils, and clay is not the best for GPR in terms of depth penetration. Um, so, if you're doing a survey here, and then you go to Florida, where it's like nice and sandy and dry, you're gonna get like much, much better depth penetration in that environment than you would here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can we see the slide with the GPR profiles and the discussion of the uh, cell? Yeah. Is that, that is that. Go back? Yeah. Oh, this one. That one. That one. While he's looking, what was the RDP that you guys found throughout? Oh, I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> First. If you didn't have any limitations or permit limitations or cost limitations, what would you add to the study? Mm, that's interesting. You want to go first? <laughs> I would do a lot more excavating, <laughs> personally. We were very limited in what we could do. It was like tiny little trenches. So, um, and we, we placed those strategically based off of all of the non-invasive um, survey that we did. So, um, but still, you know, if we caught, if we clipped something, we couldn't expand further to go catch that because we only had, like, I think it was 15 20 square meters, square meters yeah, 15, 15 um, that we could disturb. So I would put a lot more holes in the ground. <laughs> um, I'm about to admit to a mistake that we made because what I would do is I would go back and I would look at the area of the boarding house. So we were relying on, um, you know, recollection for which structure was the boarding house and which one 
it was which, we discovered that where we thought the boarding house was was the bathhouse. So I would go back and I would look at the boarding house because I'm interested in that. <laughs> I, I know I, on your uh, map, you saw the boarding house and the super budget house. Was there a saloon out there? Oh, yeah. There was a casino at one point, yeah. but it was, it was, um, you can see it. Yeah, it's labeled casino, but it was um, early. early in the mine, and then they got rid of it, I think, in like the 20s or something. Yeah. I think you mentioned the it's not on. It's not in the area. Actually, it's in the town. Is it Louisville? It's in Superior. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so it is a little bit interesting because in order to go to the company store, they would have to like go outside of the camp and through the town because it, yeah, that's where it was located. I was just thinking of a great area of study is railroads. When you have the surface now, you see that network of roads. You know, all those boulevards and avenues and things, and yet. You opened your talk with talking about railroads. I forget between two towns mm -hmm. and different things. And a lot of us keep thinking, why can't we have a whole front range railroad? You know, Fort Collins, Boulder, and on they down to Denver. <laughs> yeah. Where did all the railroad go? And was it because they put in streets and roads? That's a good question. So they they put you know, see railroad maps. Yeah, there is a railroad. There is a railroad road map in one of the books, I think. Yeah. Um, I, it's down here. Oh. Um, I think it's in that. Um, there's, there's like I, a local historian, I think, self published a book, the like the Northern Coal Fields of Colorado. I think I just got it from the Superior, the Louisville Historical Society. Um, Historical Society. Yeah. Um, so I think there is a map in that book, if I'm remembering correctly, of the railroads. Sylvia Pedham wrote a pretty thorough uh, Did she? context. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because this this talk about railroads and we don't have any. Just yeah. speak up. Yeah. 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 So it was actually like the building of the railroad is like part of why Superior even exists because like they didn't they didn't open the coal mine until there was a way to like get it out of there and then they brought in the miners and the town. Exists now. Yeah. Why do you think you didn't find a lot of stuff in the early days of the mine? I think it's a lot to do with the general disturbance of the site. Um, and so, in addition to it being cattle grazing, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of prairie dogs out there, um, and there are a lot of um, there was flooding on the site in a couple of years before we came out there. So in terms of like everything being in a reliable context order, we don't have it at the site. And just based on the artifacts we do have, like we have, we have like some bottles that literally say like 1921 on them and things like that. So just based on what we were able to see, that that's our assumption, but I think probably it could have could have gotten washed away. It could have just gotten all churned up. And everything too, like because of the cattle grazing. I don't know if you noticed on our artifact slide. Many of our artifacts are very very small fragments, and that is because of the cows. <laughs> and to like it's it's possible too that um, you know people living in the mine. Um, and families were using everything that they had. And so a lot of their um, pieces would be kept throughout generation, generations. And then during the deconstruction of the mine, I'm sure families kept whatever they could. Um, so that could be a factor too, that it was just used. <laughs> the dwellings original of the mine, were they built in 1895? This is a very good question. We don't know when they are built because we have a picture that I think is dated from 1904, where you don't see the houses on, you see the mine works, and there are no houses there yet. Um, and then we have records from when the company was absorbed into Rocky Mountain Fuel Company, and it lists the houses, and that's in 1911. So the houses are built sometime between 1904 and 1911, but we don't know when. 
you described them as you said 672 square feet we know that for sure they are 24 by 24 i do know that for sure but i need to check my number like i know for sure, i know for sure that we have a definite number of square footage i'm pretty sure it's 72 but uh i i asked because you might want to check the catalogs for pre-constructed houses of that era my dad and grew up in a 600 72 square foot house. It, it seems pretty common. That was built in 1910. Yeah, yeah it seems pretty common. And after actually in Berlin, after the um, <coughs> after the Love Massacre, they got rid of all of the housing that was built by the miners and they put in basically these taxing houses there. That also to me explains the closets because the neighborhood my dad grew up in, everyone built their own closets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's a good point. And and these were all like company houses that the company built that were the exact same, like you're saying. And we do have existing houses that were there still extant today, like the museum. So we have examples of what they are. They were. Um, there are some theories, though. There isn't like some some of the people in the Superior Historical Commission have actually proposed that the housing was built in response to the long strike because it did start in 1910 in the northern fields and we don't know when they were built so there are some people have theorized that if they were built in 1910 they were built for the the, the strike breaking workforce so but we don't actually know that it's just an interesting theory yeah yeah, yeah we'll a parking question for us. Okay. how much of your work was being yeah. a historian versus an archaeologist I don't know what killed me for that. Being archaeologist is being a historian too. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, in this site, we actually ended up relying a lot on our like uh, on our documentary sources and our oral history. Um, in I would say, in my case, probably more so than the artifact evidence. Um, you know, just barely, but I I, I relied really heavily on it, um, and that was. One, because it was available. So, and that's one of the reasons I like historical archaeology because you do have sources to compare against you. You're not just relying on excavation. Um, and two, because, um, like what we said, with some of the site issues and the site formation issues in terms of our artifacts, we had a lot of very small fragments. So, you know, we weren't always able to make the big. The biggest claims we probably have, so we had to rely on um, some of our documentary sources. Yeah, and the fact that there's like still living people um, that were children at the time and can remember their parents' stories and their own life experience. So, um, yeah, the the documentary sources as well as the living sources, not just um, the archaeological, which you could argue that those are also archaeological sources, <laughs> um, were very very important. I have two questions about water. Yeah. Um, one is where did the running water, or what is the source of the running water? And then um, what water source do you think they use to irrigate their garden? I mean, because I saw the Cold Creek Ditch is right there. Cold Creek Ditch is right there. Oh, and Cold Creek. Cold Creek Ditch is right there, and there are, oh, this is not necessarily the answer that you're looking for, but we know that they used that Cold Creek dish for fun. Um, some of the pictures that we, yeah. some of the pictures that we have are the kids playing in it. So we know that they were at least like utilizing it in, in sort of like their lives. Um, I don't know what the actual water source is. I know that the, the mine pumped it in for the mine works and because the houses were right there, they were just like, what's running the houses? <laughs> Did the audio clips say that they're pumping water from the spring? It did say from the spring, but I don't know which one. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>